Um, last week we talked about uh, the two aspects of this study. On to this day is a study about uh, that, that phrase in Scripture. It's a phrase that's found 80 times in Scripture, and yet it's so obscure that you would kind of look over it without really paying attention to it. Uh, but we were um, considering Paul's letter to Timothy when Paul said all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, uh, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. And if that's true, then that must be true about the phrase unto this day. And so many years ago uh, in our Sunday school class, I started taking a peek at this phrase unto this day when I would see it and find something interesting. And what we found was exactly what Paul says to Timothy, that in each case there's a fascinating story behind why the phrase is used. So last week we used the phrase, we looked at the phrase in 2 Kings 17, where it says of the Samaritans, when the, when the nation of Samaria is created by the Assyrians, that they feared the Lord and worshipped foreign, uh, worship their uh, foreign idols onto this day. And what we found was that onto this day relates to the day in John chapter 4 when the Lord Jesus Christ travels to Samaria because he's told by God through 2 Kings 17 that he must needs go through Samaria and he converts them so that they no longer worshipped false idols onto this day. So that's the day. So it's an interesting study. We used it as a consideration of the inspiration of Scripture because there's no way that the writer of 2, Kings 7, uh, 2 Samuel 17 I know 2 Kings 17, whoever that writer happened to be, would have ever known that he was speaking uh, for God to his son, uh, then several centuries later that his son would know that he has to go to Samaria. So it made for an interesting study on that aspect of John of uh, 2 Timothy 3.16. So today what we're going to look at is Beersheba, the story of Beersheba and how it comes to be called Beersheba onto this day. And the part of Paul's letter to Timothy that we're going to be considering is profitability of doctrine. Because Paul said to Timothy, all scripture is the main inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. So we want to consider uh, how uh, we properly use doctrine so that it is, it is useful and people want to hear what our, doc, what our doctrine is. So when I, when I mention doctrine, you know, what pops into your head when you first, when you first hear of, of doctrine as a Christadelphian? Any thoughts? I'll, I'll tell you an interesting story. When I was in, uh, teaching in southern New Hampshire, I asked that same question. And immediately, somebody said, the statement of faith. And I thought, oh, good. That's exactly what I want to talk about, is the statement of faith. I've got a little uh, highlight here of the statement of faith. There you can see the statement of faith up on the board. Uh, let me read it to you, if you will. It's only seven pages long. That the book currently known as the Bible, consisting of the scriptures of Moses, the prophets, and the apostles, is the only source of knowledge concerning God and his purpose at present extent or available in the earth, and that the same were wholly given by inspiration of God and the waters and are consequently without errors in all parts of them, except such as may be due to errors of transcription or translation, 2 Timothy 3.16, 1 Corinthians 2.13. It goes on uh, like that for a while. Um, obviously, you wouldn't want to sit here and just read off uh, the statement of faith. As marvelous as the statement of faith as it is, and as marvelous as our doctrines are, um, that's not really how we want to present uh, what doctrine is, is all about. You know, it's interesting, we have a tradition here in Boston that when you are baptized as a gift, what we give you is a copy of the Constitution and the statement of faith. So, so here is our, our, our newly baptized and excited brethren, and the first gift they get from us is what I just read to you, or one little clip of what I just read to you. And so they go home, and they're all excited, and they open up, you know, they're, they're ready to take on, and what they get is, you know, what is really uh, just a synopsis of what we want to be excited about. We, we, we don't want to treat doctrine like the statement of faith does. Not that there's anything wrong with the statement of faith. It's a marvelous statement of, statement of faith. But if you approach people as doctrine the way the statement of faith is written, there's no, there's no life to it. And what we want to do is we want to, everything okay, Phil? We want to, we want to approach it with the love and conviction that, has, that transforms a person so that they want to believe these things. And so that's really what I want to talk about, about this morning. So consider what the psalmist says about doctrine. He says this, 
He says, Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Psalm 119.97. So he places his love of doctrine at the heart of his daily studies. And so to the psalmist, doctrine is really about the love of God. And that's really what doctrine is about. It's about the love of God. If you consider what Paul says, he says this. He says, If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. So he places at the heart of all doctrine the fact that you have to have love first and foremost. And so love should be at the heart of what we preach. But, and we should be preaching doctrine. We should be teaching people about the marvelous principles that we have, but it should be done through the love that we have of doctrine. Look what he, go, he goes on to say. He goes on to say, Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. In verse 13 he says, And now abideth faith, hope, and love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. So you see, it's, it, it's not just a nice feature of our faith and of our doctrines, but love is, is intricately intertwined in all of our beliefs. It's actually the most powerful part of our beliefs. Consider what Jesus said when they asked him what the greatest commandment was. To love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all my soul, and with all thy mind, and to love thy neighbor as thyself. It's the foundation of what doctrine should be all about. So how does the Lord present doctrine? Well, that's what it says, teaches us in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 2. This verse says, this is the Lord speaking about his doctrine. My doctrine shall drop as the rain. My speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass. And this actually is the first use of the word doctrine in Scripture, is in Deuteronomy 32. And this is the way the Lord describes how to use doctrine. And he describes it as small rain upon the tender herb and as the showers upon the grass. And that's the way we should be presenting doctrine. And that's not necessarily the way doctrine is always presented. Sometime instead of being presented as the light rain upon the herb, it's presented as a tornado upon the ground. And, and, and needless to say, people kind of back off. Like, whoa, that's, and that's not the way the Lord presents it. And so I bring this up because, well, first of all, consider the way the Lord Jesus Christ presented doctrine with the Samaritan woman. Now, we looked at the Samaritan woman last week, and we talked about the inspiration of Scripture. But it says, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for all those things. So you could look at the same piece of Scripture and go through each of those things, profitable for doctrine, profitable for reproof, and so on, and use the same thing in Scripture. <clears throat> now, we're not doing that. We're looking at different uses of onto this day. So last week we used the story of the Samaritan woman to teach the lesson about the inspiration of Scripture. But think of how Jesus presents doctrine to the Samaritan woman. He says in uh, John chapter 4, verse 7, remember the story. So when the Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said unto her, I, uh, Will you give me a drink? And she says to him, You are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And of course, he does give her living water, right? We looked at that last week. He teaches her about how to worship in spirit and in truth. Remember, they were worshiping in sincerity, but they weren't worshiping in truth. And so he lovingly, she's not, he, he didn't, had never even met her. He offers it as a free offering to the woman. And this is the way doctrine ought to be offered. So our solution is to embrace doctrine, not as a weapon against the enemy, but humbly as an offering of love from the love of God. We should be excited about our doctrines. Because our doctrines are the greatest offer ever given to anybody. They are the way onto salvation. And we don't, I don't want to speak to everybody because I think some people do a wonderful job of talking about their doctrines. But it ought to be a doctrine of tremendous hope and of tremendous passion and not of tremendous argument. Because, because nothing, trans, arguments don't transform. 
What transforms people is if you touch if you touch their heart. And so that's how we want to teach doctrine. Now it doesn't mean that we want to cover up doctrine or that we want to hide from it. Look what Paul says in Titus. He says, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. So Paul talking to, to Titus and talking about how you use doctrine, he says you hold on to it so that you might exhort. Well, of course, exhort means to lift up. And that's really what our doctrines should be doing and ought to be doing and do, and do do for us. They lift us up. And so when we're talking to people who are having troubles with their understanding, what we want to do is we want to lift those people up. We want to excite them about the kingdom of God. We want to excite them about the promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We want to excite them about God's grace. We want to excite them about the return of Jesus Christ. These are great doctrines. These are powerful doctrines. And that's what we want to teach people about. And we want to show them. We want to do it in a positive way. And so what we're going to do, and this is such a wonderful story, we're going to take a look at the story of Beersheba. And what happens in the story of Beersheba is the Lord teaches both Abraham and then Isaac some of his fundamental doctrines about both his power and his will. But he does it in a way, he does it in a way of great love and great understanding and great patience. And we're going to see that love and that patience as we walk through the stories. So it comes from Genesis chapter 26 and verse 32 and 33. And it says there in Genesis 32, um, Genesis 26, 32 and 33, and it came to pass the same day that Isaac's servants came and told him concerning the well that they had digged, and said unto him, We have found water, and it shall be called Sheba. Therefore the name of the city is Beersheba unto this day. Again, it's Genesis 26, verses 32 and 33. Well, there's a lot that happens for that to come together. But you can see it talks about 26, verses 32 and 33 how it says that it became to be called Beersheba unto this, di unto this day. Now last week when we looked at unto this day, we were trying to figure out when the phrase is referring to. When it said that the Samaritans worshipped that way unto this day, well what day were they talking about? The interesting thing about Beersheba is you not actually need to really do a lot of consideration about when as much as why. So the intriguing part of the story of Beersheba is not when is being spoken of unto this day, it's why it's called Beersheba unto this day. And the reason I say that is this, because when is easy. Because if you look on a map, go onto Google Maps or anywhere, and you go to Israel, you are going to find the city of Beersheba, right where the city of Beersheba has been for the last 4,000 years. It's actually one of the oldest cities in the world, and it's still there on to this day. And in actual fact, it'll always be there because of what it represents. So there's a picture right there of modern day Beersheba. Again, it's about 4,000 years, years old. And it's been there ever since the day that Abraham dug a well and, and founded, founded the place. Um, it's located in the south, in the desert regions of, uh, of Israel or the land of Palestine. Um, and it's, the, the remarkable part of the story is it's in a very dry, arid land, and yet, as you can tell by the picture, it's a very prosperous place because they found water, and it's always had water. And the name of, the name of, the, of Beersheba is the Well of the Oath, or the Well of Seven. And there's actually seven wells, even to this day, in Beersheba. But we'll, so, so when it talks about on to this day, well, the day is yesterday, today, tomorrow, and forever. It'll always be called... Beersheba, and it'll always be there. But why is it there? Why is it called Beersheba? That's what we're going to consider um, this evening. So here's a map of Beersheba. Again, you can see it's located in, in the south on the way to Egypt. Um, it's often the marker of the southern boundaries of the land of Palestine. You'll see in Scripture it talks about from Dan to Beersheba, and Dan is the northern point in Beersheba is the southern point. Uh, Abraham founded Beersheba. We'll look at that story in a minute. And he actually lived there for the rest of his life. After the story of where he offers up his son Isaac uh, 
on Mount Moriah. He moves back to Beersheba after he offers Isaac on Mount Moriah, and they live the rest of his life in Beersheba. Now, the interesting part of that story is, if you look at the context, it looks like Sarah is not living with him uh, in Beersheba. She was actually living up in Hebron, which is kind of an interesting fact that for the rest of their life, they were, it appears that they were separated. Not all that surprising when you consider what happened on Mount Moriah and how much tension that might have created in the family. Uh, but he ends up moving to Beersheba with Isaac, and they end up living in Beersheba. And they actually lived in Beersheba for quite a long time. They lived there for the rest of Abraham's life, and they lived there for most of Isaac's life, all the way to the point in the story of Jacob, where Jacob flees from Esau and heads up to Haran. All the way up to that point, they had lived in Beersheba. You don't often consider Beersheba as one of the principal cities in the story of the patriarchs, but they'd actually lived there uh, for quite some time. So the question we want to ask is, how did it come to be? So the story really begins in Genesis chapter 12. So if you want to open up to Genesis chapter 12, we're going to take a look at a few uh, interesting stories. And what we're going to do is we're going to go through the life of Abraham very quickly. We certainly don't have time to rip through the entire life of Abraham. But we're going to take a look at the uh, story of Abraham and the role that Beersheba plays in the story of Abraham and the lessons that Abraham learns in his life. And then we're going to look at the st how it relates in Isaac. And they're two very similar stories, save for something extremely unique in the difference between the two stories. And, and we're going to find that uniqueness really fascinating about why it says Beersheba is called Beersheba on to this day. So just as a quick paraphrase of what happens in uh, Abraham chapter 12, verse 1, we know that Abraham is called to flee from Ur of the Chaldees. He says in verse 2, the Lord says, And I will make thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing. In verse 1, by the way, he says, Go and uh, leave thy father's house onto a land that I will show thee. So we know that Abraham takes his family. They leave from Ur of the Chaldees. They end up in Haran. They leave, eventually leave Haran and head down into the land of Canaan. And in verses 6 through 8, he comes to Canaan. It says, verse 6, And Abraham passed through the land onto the place of Shechem, onto the plain of Moreh. And the Canaanite was then in the land. Now notice in verse 7 it says, And the Lord appeared unto Abraham and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land, and there build he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. So at Shechem, uh, the Lord uh, Abraham builds an altar, and the Lord appears unto Abraham. So why does he appear unto Abraham in Shechem? Well, because Abraham has come into the land that the Lord wants him to, wants him to see, right? So once he gets into the land... And the Lord appears and says, okay, so this is, this is the land I was talking to you about. Before that, he doesn't, right? Other than he tells him to leave Haran and head south, which he does. But he doesn't speak to him until he comes to Shechem. Now, notice what happens in verse 8. So now, now Abraham has got this land that he wants to discover. It says in verse 8, And he removed from thence onto the mountains on the east of Bethel, and pitched his tent, having Bethlehem on the west and Hai on the east. And there he built an altar unto the Lord, and the Lord called, and he called upon the name of the Lord. Now notice there's a subtle difference between Bethel and Shechem, right? Because in Shechem, the Lord appeared unto him. So he goes to Bethel, which is not that far away. He builds an altar again. He calls on the name of the Lord, but notice the Lord doesn't appear unto him. So what the Lord does is he's going to test Abraham. And what he's going to do is he's going to take himself sort of out of the picture. He's not going to make himself immediately present to Abraham, to test Abraham's faith, to see if Abraham is going to trust that God is always with him. And that's the test that goes on. And you can see it right in the story, because look what it says. First of all, in verse 9 it says, And Abraham journeyed south, going still toward the south. So Abraham, the Lord, doesn't appear to him in Bethel. And so he packs his things up and he heads south. Now notice what it says in verse 10. And there was a famine in the land. Now why are we told there's a famine in the land? And you might say, well, because there was no food and water. That's what a famine is, right? But this is Abraham, and this is God testing Abraham. So understand, when you see there's a famine in the land, it's talking to about God's relationship to Abraham. And we just pointed out that God has taken himself from the immediate presence of Abraham. He's taken himself away from that. And that's what the famine is. 
And the reason that the Lord done that is to test Abraham because he wants Abraham to come to understand that whether he is physically present, he's always there. And that's the lesson that Abraham's going to come to understand. And so the famine is part of the test. It's both the famine of food and water, but it's also the famine of the presence of God. So he takes himself away. And so look what happens. It says, And Abraham went down into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. So here's a, here's a, 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 a biblical lesson for you, if you will. Biblical word lesson. You never want to go down to Egypt. Right? Because <laughs> Egypt represents sin. You always know Egypt represents the power of the flesh because of what Egypt is, right? What's the greatest things in Egypt? The pyramids, right? And what are they? They're a tribute to man's ability, that's the flesh, and their graves. Contrary to what the politician called them uh, earlier this year, uh, the pyramids of graves. And that's what Egypt is. Egypt is the power of the flesh. And so you never want to go down to Egypt. Now Abraham goes down to Egypt, it says he goes down to sojourn. Well, that's an important word, right? Because we're all sojourners here. We, we know that we live in this country, but we're sojourners. We don't dwell here. And it's always a challenge to sojourn and not start dwelling there. And of course, the difference is just the difference that we all, we all represent today in our lives. That we'll be, we're a part of this, this world that we live in, but we're not of it. We are of another kingdom. We are of Christ. And so the same would be true with Abraham and Isaac. They were to be sojourners. That's why they lived in tents. But it's really hard to sojourn in Egypt because Egypt is a great power of the flesh. But he goes down to Egypt nonetheless. And he sojourns there. Verse 11. And it came to pass when he was come near to the, to the enter into Egypt that he said out to Sarah his wife, Behold, I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. Therefore it shall come to pass when the Egyptians shall say to thee that they shall say, This is thy wife, they will kill me, but they will save thee, save thee alive. Say, I pray thee, thou art my sister, that it may be well with me for thy sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. Now, notice who Abraham is afraid of. He's afraid of the Egyptians. Notice also that God is not mentioned here at all. We said that God has taken himself away to test Abraham, to see if he's going to trust that God is with him even throughout his trials. And no sooner does he end up down in Egypt that he fears for his life, and so he tells Sarai, his wife, listen, I'm afraid of these people because of your beauty. So tell them that you're my sister. And so she does actually tell them that she's his sister. This is what we used to call when I was growing up a white lie. He's, because she was his half-sister. But that's not really the point, right? The point is that he was, he was, she was his wife, and yet she lied for him. And so we know what happens, right? We know that time passes, and Pharaoh starts to recognize something is going on, right? So pick up in verse um, 17. And the Lord plagued Pharaoh in his house with a great plague because of Sarah, Abraham's wife, of Sarai. And Pharaoh called Abraham and said, What is this that thou hast done unto me? Why didst thou not tell me that she was thy wife? And so Pharaoh starts to pick up that something go something's going on. And he recognizes that, that Abraham has been lying to him and that this was actually his wife. Well, how does he know that, by the way? Well, I think the, I think the hint is given in chapter 13, verse 1. Because notice, notice what it says. And Abraham went out of Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and Lot with him. In verse 2, And Abraham was very rich in cattle, silver, and gold. So he got wealthy down in Egypt. So he leaves, he's in a famine, so, such a desperate famine, such a desperate, desperate situation down in the south, that he goes down to Egypt, and by the time he leaves Egypt, he's a wealthy man. And we're actually going to see this happen a couple different, couple different times. And I think Pharaoh recognized there's something happening here. Why is, this guy prosper? Why is this guy prospering so much? And somehow he starts to figure out it's because of the situation, situation with his wife. And so Pharaoh sends him away. And it says, And he went on his journeys, in verse 3, from the south even to Beth-el, onto the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Beth-el and Hai. Verse 4. 
onto the place of the altar which he had made an altar, and there Abraham called upon the name of the Lord. And the Lord does not appear uh, onto Abraham again until the time when um, Lot, Lot leaves. In verse, in verse 13, Lot ends up leaving, and then the Lord appears to Abraham um, after, the, after that. It's Genesis 12, verse 11 and 13. So, so just to point out in, in Genesis 12, 11 and 13, it says, where he says, Pray, I, tell, I, say, I tell thee that you are my sister. We know that that happens again, right? We know in the story with Abimelech in chapter 20 that again he tells this lie. And just to point out one interesting uh, side note to that. So in chapter 12, uh, Sarah says that she's, she's his sister. In chapter 20, Abraham says she's my sister because Sarah's not going to repeat the lie again. And it's Abraham actually that repeats the lie in chapter 20. So what happens in between uh, chapter 12 and chapter 20? And all I want to point out is just a few quick references to all the times that the Lord appears to Abraham between chapter 12 and chapter 20. And the reason I point it out is this. Abraham tells a lie to Pharaoh. So he's lying. And he perpetuates that lie even to the time when he, when he tells it again with Abimelech. And yet the Lord continues to be with him throughout the process of this, of this lie. So in, verse, in chapter 13, uh, the Lord appears to him after Lot leaves. And when he appears to him, he talks to him about, about the covenant and the promise, the promise of the land. In verse 14, uh, Abraham saves Lot um, and meets Melchizedek. In chapter 15, the, Lot appears, the Lord appears to Abraham again and makes a covenant concerning the land and everlasting life. So the Lord appears to him in chapter 15 and makes a covenant with him. He appears to him again in chapter 17 and establishes the covenant of circumcision. He appears to him in chapter 18 in the plains of Mamre with the three angels before they go and destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. So again and again and again, the Lord keeps appearing to Abraham. Even though Abraham has this lie, yet the Lord continues to make covenants with him, continues to make promises with him, all the way till chapter 20. So let's come to chapter, chapter 20. Chapter 20 in verse 1. And Abraham journeyed thence towards the south country and dwelt between Kadesh and Shur and sojourned in Gerar. And Abraham said of his wife, She is my sister. And Abimelech, king of, Se of Gerar, sent and took her. So where, where is it that he went? Well, he was up around Hebron on this map, and he traveled down uh, to Gerar, which, as you can see on this map, is <laughs> somewhere down here. It's a little too far away for me to be able to tell. But you can see it on, on the map. The arrow actually, actually points, points to it. And so, and so Abraham tells Abimelech that she's his sister, and Abimelech takes her. And verse 3 says, And God came to Abimelech in a dream by night, and said to him, Behold, thou art but a dead man, for the woman which thou hast taken, she is a man's wife. So the Lord doesn't appear to Abraham. He appears to Abimelech. Right? So you can imagine how Abraham must felt about the fact that the Lord didn't appear to him, but appeared to this, this other guy. Now Abraham has lied, right? And yet the Lord says to Abimelech, you're a dead man because you've got another man's wife. And so Abimelech says, hey, wait a minute. He says in verse 4, but Abimelech had not come near to her. Uh, and He said, Lord, wilt thou slay also a righteous nation? Said he not unto me, she is my sister? And she even herself said, he is my brother in the integrity of my heart, the innocence, so she must have verified what he said. In innocency of my hands have I done this. Verse 6, And God said unto him in a dream, Yea, I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thy heart, for I also withheld thee from sinning against me, therefore suffer thee not to touch her. So the Lord says, Yeah, you didn't touch her, but you didn't touch her because I didn't allow it to happen. And then he says, verse 7, Now therefore, restore the man 
his wife, for he is a prophet, and he shall pray thee, and thou shalt live. And if thou restore her not, know that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that art thine. So Abraham lies to Abimelech. Abimelech does nothing wrong by, by all the standards of the day. And yet the Lord says to him, he's my prophet. Give him back his wife and have him pray for you. So you can imagine Abimelech's response to it, right? He's like, why should I, why should I be asking him to pray for me? Shouldn't, shouldn't you know, aren't, aren't I the innocent one? And yet here's the lesson. The lesson is, that's my man. Right or wrong, he's my guy. And, and, and Abraham is wrong, right? The man of great faith, in this case, has lied. But, but he is still the Lord's servant. He is still God's servant. And so he says, you have him pray for you. And so that's exactly what happens. Therefore Abimelech rose early in the morning and called all his servants and told all these things in their ears. And the men were sore afraid. Now notice they're afraid. So Abraham, Abimelech has a dream. And he basically scares them and says, change this, or you and your entire household is, is going to die. So they're afraid of the power of God. Does that make sense? Then, then Abimelech called Abraham and said, Why have you done this? What have I done to offend thee? Why have you brought this upon my, king, my kingdom? Perfectly uh, understandable uh, things, thing to say, to be perfectly honest with you. Why have you, why have you put me in this, in this situation? Now Abimelech said unto Abraham, verse 10, What sawest thou that thou hast done this thing? And Abraham said, Because I thought, Surely the fear of God is not in this place, and they will slay me for my wife's sake. So that's a little different than the situation with Pharaoh. Because in the situation with Pharaoh, first of all, he doesn't answer Pharaoh when Pharaoh says, Why have you done this? Secondly, he was afraid of Pharaoh. And this time what he says is, I was afraid that you didn't understand God. And so I was afraid of you. And so he's, he's starting to grow in his understanding. But he's still afraid, and so he's still, and so he's still to, told the lie. And he said, and he says, and yet she is my sister. And he says in verse 13 of Genesis 20, And it came to pass when God saw me to wander from my father's house, that I said unto her, Take, Make this thy kindness that thou shalt show unto me at every place whither we shall come. Say of me, he is my brother. And that is Abraham's confession. Abraham says, you know what? From the time we left at the very beginning, I asked her to do this for me because I was afraid. And yet think about it. The Lord appeared to Abimelech and the situation was changed. Not to Abraham, but to Abimelech. And so the kindness of God upon Abraham, who was not trusting in God, was to show himself before Abimelech so that Abraham would come to trust in God. And actually, from this point on, with everything that Abraham does, because it's after this that he offers up Isaac, and everything else that goes through his life, we never hear about Abraham sinning again. From this point on, he always puts his trust in God. And he always recognizes that whether he is physically present, whether it's with angels or with visions, that God is always with him. And that's the lesson of the story of Abimelech, with Abraham. So look what it says uh, moving forward. Look what happens in verse 22. This is of Genesis 21, verse 22. So Abraham leaves Gerar, and he moves away from, from um, that area, and he starts heading back up towards uh, the desert area, and sure enough, he ends up, in, in the end, he ends up in Beersheba. And what happens is Abimelech and Phicol, the chief of the army, come to him. Verse 22 of chapter 21. And it came to pass at that time that Abimelech and Phicol, the chief captain of, the, of his host, spake unto Abraham, saying, God is with thee in all that thou doest. Well, how do they know that? Well, from the time that Abraham leaves Gerar and starts heading into the desert, he starts digging wells. And every place he digs wells in the desert, he hits water. And every time he hits water, one of the Philistine uh, uh, Abimelech's men come and they confiscate the well and take it away from Abraham and his men. And they move back a little further and they dig another well. And along come the Philistines and they confiscate that well. And they move a little further, all the way to the point where they get to Beersheba. 
And by the time they get to Beersheba, Abimelech and Phicol, the, 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 army of his, the captain of his host, which means his army, start to recognize there's something about this guy. He's clearly got God with him because nobody strikes, <coughs> strikes water so consistently in the desert. And so they come to him. Now, why does Abimelech come with the captain of his host? Why would you bring the captain of your army with you if you're going to have a confab with your adversary? Well, it's a question of strength against strength, right? You've got God with you, clearly, because you keep striking well. Well, I've got an army. So let's create a little covenant here so I'm not troubling you and you're not troubling me, okay? Because clearly, you've got something with you, but clearly I've got somebody with me as well. And that's really what this whole confab is about. He says in verse 23, Now therefore, this is Abimelech speaking to, Abimelech speaking to Abraham. He says, Now therefore swear unto me here by God that thou wilt not deal falsely with me, nor with my son, nor with my son's sons. But according to the kindness that I have done unto thee, thou wilt show unto me to do the, and to the land wherein thou hast sojourned. And Abraham said, I will swear. And so he says, listen, we're going to make a deal, you and I. It's going to be a covenant of peace. You're not going to bother me. I'm not going to bother you. It'll be a deal on our level, our son's level, and our son's son's level all three generations. We got this deal, right? And Abraham says, yeah, I'll agree to the deal. And then Abraham starts to question him and, and admonish him about the wells that he's digging. And he had dug this well in Beersheba. And he said, listen, I'm going to give you some things to declare that this is my well. So you guys can't now come and confiscate this well. And he gives them uh, lands and ewes and that kind of stuff. And Abimelech says, fine, that's your well. So, so this is mine, where Beersheba is. And we run, we're under the deal here, right? And he says, yes. So notice what happens. Wherefore, verse 31, wherefore he called the place Beersheba, because there they swear both of them. And remember, Beersheba means the well of the oath. But notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say that it's called Beersheba unto this day. It says, verse 32, Thus they made a covenant at Beersheba, where Abimelech rose in Phicol, the chief captain of the host, and they returned into the land of the Philistines. And Abraham planted a grove in Beersheba and called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. And so an oath is made at Beersheba between Abimelech and Abraham. And so the place is called Beersheba, the well of the oath. But it's not called Beersheba unto this day. That phrase is not there. And the reason is because that's not the oath that Beersheba is referencing to when you, Beersheba is referencing to the place that is still called Beersheba unto this day. That takes place in chapter 26. And let's go to chapter 26. We'll take a 10 past 8. Oh, that's not bad. We'll take a look at the story of when Isaac meets with Abimelech. So between chapter, the chapter we just looked at and chapter 26 is about 100 years go by. And Isaac is still living in Beersheba. Abraham and Sarah have both died. And now it's a hundred years later. And it says in verse 26, uh, chapter 26 and verse 1, there's a map, and there's 26, verse 1. And there was a famine in the land besides the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. Now, that's an interesting thing to say. There's a famine in the land besides the first famine. In other words, this isn't the same famine. Well, of course it isn't the same famine. It's 100 years later. I mean, it wasn't a 100-year famine. It's, we know it's not the same famine. So then why is it saying to us, this is a different famine? Because it's a different type of famine. Remember the famine with Abraham. The Lord takes his physical presence, or God, actually, let me be specific, takes his physical presence away so that Abraham will learn the lesson that God is always with him, right? And God is about, the word God is Elohim, and it's about the power of God. And what we're going to find here is a different type of famine. In this famine, God doesn't take his presence away. He's actually still there. In fact, you can see it right there in verse 2. And the Lord appeared unto him, that's Isaac, and said, Go, go not down into Egypt. So the Lord doesn't, uh, God doesn't physically take himself away. He stays with, with Isaac. But it's another famine. In this case, he's proving Isaac's faith. And what he wants Isaac to do is to recognize that the will of God 
is always with him. Not the presence of God, but the will of God. And there's a big difference between the will of the Lord and the presence of God. Because the presence of God is about the power. Remember, Abimelech was afraid of Abraham's power. The will of God is about the purpose of God. And what we're going to see in the story of Isaac is a realization that that well and that Beersheba is about the everlasting presence of God's will in the life of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he's going to teach it to Isaac. And so that's why it tells us it's a different type, type of famine. And Isaac went on to Abimelech, king of the Philistines, on to Gerar. Well, he went from where? Well, he's in Beersheba. So he's in Beersheba, and there's a famine. He doesn't go down to Egypt the way Abraham did. And the Lord, because the Lord tells him, the Lord speaks to him, says, don't go to Egypt. Oh, notice what the Lord says. And the Lord appeared unto him and said, do not go down into Egypt. Dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of. So how is the Lord going to tell him where to dwell? He says, I'm going to tell you. How's he going to tell you? Well, that's easy. The way, same way he told is when you get to the place I want you to get to, then I'll speak to you. And that's what he did. Remember when he came to Shechem, right? When he comes to Shechem. You're, okay, you're in the land. Now, now I'm going to talk to you. So, that's, so that's, that's how he's going to do it, right? But he says in verse 3, Sojourn in this land, and I will be with thee, and I will bless thee, for unto thee and unto thy seed I will give thee all these countries, and, and I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham thy father. So, so Isaac has gone from Beersheba down to Gerar, where Abimelech is, right? We'll talk about Abimelech in a minute. And the Lord appears to him and says, Dwell where I tell you, but sojourn here. And then I'll give you what, what, what you need to do. And again, there's a big difference between sojourning and dwelling, right? But here he tells them to sojourn. But look what happens in verse 6. Verse 6, Genesis 26. And Isaac dwelled in Gerar. Did the Lord appear to him in Gerar? Well, he did originally, yes. But told him, I'm going to tell you where to, where to dwell. But sojourn here. But Isaac dwells in Gerar. Verse 7, and the men of that place asked him of his wife, and he said, she is my sister. Well, there's a family tradition, <laughs> right? Every time you're in trouble, claim your wife is your sister. And so he used, and it's not, this time it's not a white lie, because in no regard was Rebecca ever Isaac's sister. Sarah was Abraham's half-sister, but Rebecca was never Isaac's sister. So he's telling a full, flat-out lie. Verse 8. And it came to pass when he had been there a long time. So recognize that he had been there uh, quite a long time, down, down in Gerar. And that plays an important point uh, when, we consider, when we consider what goes on. And it came to pass when he had been there a long time, that Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out a window and saw, and behold, Isaac sporting with Rebekah, his wife. And Abimelech called Isaac and said, Behold, of a surety, she is thy wife. And how sayest that? She is my sister. And Isaac said unto him, Because I said, Lest I die for her. So Abimelech sees her. Now let me make a point about Abimelech. This is a hundred years later from the time that Abimelech came to Abraham with the chief of his host, Phicol. What are the chances this is the same guy? Well, there's probably none because he had to have been a full adult at the time he came to Abraham. And people didn't live for 250 years. Right? So, so it's a different guy. But he's not given a different characteristic in any way. Because the word wants you to, to carry what happens with, with uh, Abimelech and Phicol and Abraham over to Genesis 26. So he has the same name, even though he's a different person. It's probably a title, just like Phicol, the captain of the house, is probably a title. But just you, the, the, the individual and what they represent when he meets with Abraham is the same representation here when he meets with Isaac. And so he's given the exact same name, and he recognizes that this is, this is not his wife, or this is not his sister. And Abimelech said, what is that that thou hast done? Verse 10. Uh, one of the people might have taken her. And Abimelech charged all his people, saying, he that touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. 
Then notice in verse 12, Then Isaac sowed in the land and received in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. And the man waxed great and went forward and grew until he became very great. There's a famine going on, right? Right at the beginning of the chapter, we told there's a famine. And yet Isaac becomes wealthier and wealthier and wealthier, just like we saw with Abraham in Egypt. So the true is same is true with Isaac down in Gerar. And it said in verse, says in verse 14, For ye had possessions of flocks and possession of herds and a great store of servants, and the Philistines envied him. Now notice that, that word there because it's important. Isaac gained great possessions. The possessions were Isaac's. And he's in a famine, and he's in Gerar, and he's prospering when nobody else is prospering. So finally, um, he's sent away, right? Verse 16, And Abimelech said unto Isaac, Go from us, for thou art much mightier than we. Power. So Abimelech says to Isaac, I recognize that you're powerful. Get out of here. So what happens? Well, the same thing happens with Isaac as is what happens with Abraham. As Isaac starts to move away from Gerar, and as he moves away, he reopens his father's wells. And every time he reopens one of the wells, along come the Philistines and take over the well again. And again, and again, and again, until where does he end up? But he ends up right back in Beersheba. Turn over to chapter 26 and verse 22. Uh, Verse 23, rather. Oh, Actually, let's pick it up in verse 22. And he removed from thence and digged another well, for they that... For they that strove not, and he called the name of it Rehoboth, for he said, For now the Lord hath made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. And he went up from thence to Beersheba. So he ends up back at Beersheba. Remember, he had gone down to Gerar, and the Lord had spoke to him, and he said, I'm going to tell you where to dwell, but sojourn here. And he sojourned, and he, and he dwelled in Gerar, became prosperous in Gerar, get kicked out of Gerar, sojourns back out, ends up back in Beersheba, and the Lord, verse 24, appeared unto him the same night. So the Lord appeared on him and said, Yep, you're right back where you started, and you're right back where I wanted you to be in the first place. This is where I want you, I want you to dwell. I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father. Fear not, for I am with thee, and I will bless thee and multiply thy seed for thy servant uh, Abraham's sake. And he built an altar there and called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there, and there Isaac's servants digged a well. And then who shows up but Abimelech? Now this is, this is really the heart of this story, because what happens next is one of the most wonderful aspects of God's love for doctrine that you're ever going to see. And you have to really pay attention because it's hidden. Because notice what it says. It says, Then Abimelech went to him from Gerar, and Ahuzath, one of his friends, and Phicol, the chief captain of his army. So remember back in the days of Abraham, right? uh, Abimelech shows up with Phicol, the captain of his house. And he's he's got a situation in which I've got an army, you've got a god, you've got power, I've got power. Let's work something out. And remember what they worked out was a covenant that was supposed to last from generation to generation. It ended as soon as Abraham died. As soon as Abraham died, they started taking all the wells back again. And now he comes again. Only he comes again with one subtle difference. Do you see the subtle difference? It's right there in verse 26. And he went from thence, and Ahuzath, one of his friends, remember we said all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable to doctrine, etc., etc., etc. So who is this Ahuzath? This is the only place his name is mentioned. This is the only direct reference we're given. Who is he? And why does it say one of his friends' name is Ahuzath? What does it mean that Abimelech brings a friend of his to meet Isaac? Think about it for a minute. What what would that possibly mean? Well, it doesn't really mean anything. He's He's got the captain of his army, right? He's the guy with power. He got the captain of his army. And it just happens to mention on the side that he brings this friend by the name of Ahuzath, with him. Why? Here's why. Because Ahuzath wasn't just a friend of Abimelech's. That's not what that's talking about. He was a friend of Isaac's. 
And I'll show you exactly why in two different stages why I say that. First of all, well, let me get three stages. First of all, it only makes sense. Because the fact that Abimelech happens to bring a friend of his along with him is, is virtually meaningless. But if he's a friend of Isaac's, remember Isaac dwelled in Gerar a long time. And what did he talk about while he dwelled in Gerar? He talked about the covenants of his father. And how do we know that? Two things. One, Ohuzath means possessions. That's what the word means. And who's the guy that had the possessions? Well, it's right there earlier in the chapter. It's Isaac. Isaac's the guy with the possessions. And Ahuzath is one of the possessions. And the second thing is what he says next. Well, first of all, let's, what he says in verse 28. But let's pick up what Isaac says first in verse 27. And Isaac said unto them, Wherefore come ye unto me, seeing ye hate me, and have sent me away from you? So Isaac is upset. Right? Isaac is furious because he's been sent away and every place that he goes along, they, they come and they commandeer the wells and they take over the wells. And he pushes them further and further and further away. And Isaac is furious at what they did and what they've been doing. What's he forgetting? He's forgetting that the will of God is with him. He's forgetting that the will of God runs through him. He's forgetting that his entire life is about the plan and purpose of God. Instead, he's just mad at them. And we understand why he's mad at them. But he's forgetting because the famine is there. And it's the famine of the recognition of the will of God. And who tells him about the will of God? That's what happens in verse 28. And they said, who's the they? You say, well, uh, Abimelech and, and Phicol. It's a who's at. He's speaking for them. How do we know? Because what he says. We saw that certainly the Lord was with thee. Not God, but the Lord was with thee. We recognize that the will of God was with you. Now that's different than the story of Abraham. In the story of Abraham, it was all about God. In the story of Isaac, it's all about the Lord. In fact, throughout this, this, this context here of the story of Abimelech, the Lord's name is used seven times. And it's all about God's will being done. That's where the famine was. That Isaac was not recognizing that God's will was being done. So what does the Lord do? The Lord sends a friend that Isaac had met in Gerar when he dwelled in Gerar. He was never supposed to dwell there. And yet, as he dwells in Gerar, he makes his friend in Gerar, and he tells his friends about the very covenants that he has and his father has with the Lord. All the plans for, for, for the land and all the plans for everlasting life. And it's a who's at that comes and speaks to him and says, We saw that the Lord is with thee, and we said, Let there now be an oath betwixt us, us and thee, and let us make a covenant with thee, that thou shalt not hurt us, and we not touch thee. And nor have we done thee nothing but good, and have sent thee away in peace. Thou art now the blessed of the Lord. And you know what that phrase means, the blessed of the Lord? We recognize that you are the servant of the Lord. Isaac himself wasn't recognizing that he was the servant of the Lord. All he was recognizing was that he was getting pushed, he was getting pushed around. And it's a Huzath that tells him, hey, we recognize that you're the blessed of the Lord. And look what happens to Isaac in the very next verse. And he made them a feast. And they did eat and drink. He made them a feast. He was just yelling at them. He was just saying, how dare you come to me? And now all he has to be told is what a Huzath speaks to him there in verse 28, and he says he made him a feast. Why? Because it was a Ahuzath opening the eyes of Isaac that the Lord's will was being done through Isaac, even though Isaac didn't see it himself. And what's the doctrine that's being taught? That the Lord's will has done and will always be done through the covenants of Abraham, the covenants of Isaac, and eventually the covenants of Jacob. It's one of the most foundational doctrines that we believe in. And here it is being 
ex uh, expressed out to Isaac of all people, the friend that he made while he was dwelling in sin. I mean, it's an incredible act of love that God does to open up this doctrine to Isaac. And so look what happens. And they rose up in the morning and swore to one another, and Isaac sent them away, and they departed from him in peace. Then it come to pass the same day that Isaac's servants came, this is verse 32, and told him concerning the well which they had digged, and said that we have found water. Well, what's the water? The water is the truth of the word. They'd struck water. That's exactly what had happened in Isaac's life. He had struck water through the friendship of his friend Ahuzath, who had opened up his eyes to the will of the Lord. And they struck water. Look what it says. And he called it Sheba. Therefore, the name of the city is Beersheba unto this day. It's all about the will of the oath. It's all about the Lord's will being done in the life of his servants. Now recognize this about Abraham, who was a man of great faith, the father of the faithful. And recognize this about Isaac, who was his son, who was a reflection of the Lord Jesus Christ. They all had flaws. They all made mistakes in their lives, and yet the Lord still blessed them. And the Lord's glory was still revealed in their life despite their flaws. And that's what we sometimes forget with our doctrines. We think our doctrine is about creating perfection. Perfection has been created through the Lord Jesus Christ. One of the things we'll find as we go through the different stories of on to this day is we're going to see again and again and again the need these people had for a Redeemer. Because the only way that God is fully glorified if, it is, if He is perfected, and He is perfected only in His Son. And the rest of us are redeemed by His Son's perfection. And it was no different for Abraham and for Isaac and for Jacob and for all the rest of the patriarchs, for David and everybody else. They all needed to come, come to realize they needed a redeemer. And now here's Isaac, who is angry. He has lost the understanding of God's will being done. And the Lord sends a Huzath, his possession. Really, it's the Lord's possession to open up his eyes to God's will. I mean, it's a, it's a wonderful story. And that's why it's called... Uh, Beersheba unto this day, because God's will will always be done through the covenants he made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And think of how many people have forgotten that. How, many, how many, much of Christianity teaches that, that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob doesn't, it doesn't even really matter anymore. There's a city in Israel today that represents that covenant, always has and always will, and that city is called Beersheba. And so that's the story of Beersheba on to this day and the marvelous doctrine of the promises made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and how the Lord's will is always, always done through his servants. Next week, Lord willing, and it is next Wednesday that we have the next class, we're going to be taking a look at the part of the doctrine where it talks about reproof and correction. And we're going to look at the story of Gilgal. And then where Gilgal, it says Gilgal is called Gilgal on to this day. And I can tell you, uh, unlike Beersheba, as a little hint for next week, that Gilgal does not exist today. So it's speaking of a different day than forever. Gilgal isn't even in Israel anymore. So that's the BibleTruthAndProphecy.com is a worldwide collaboration by Christadelphians to help promote the understanding of God's Word to those who are seeking the truth about the human condition and God's plan and purpose with this earth and with mankind upon it. Bible Truth and Prophecy is part of a wider set of online resources provided by ChristadelphianVideo.org for establishing just how far removed the true Christian teaching of the first century apostles is from that taught by mainstream Christendom today. BibleTruthandProphecy.com is very much a standalone website but benefits from our vast network of sites and resources and social media. Here are just a few of the things that BibleTruthAndProphecy.com offers. We have a good number of written articles supplied to us from brothers from all over the globe. These deal with first principle issues, creation versus evolution, the inspiration of the Bible, and so much more. We have a whole section of video study series. These are studies that have been posted onto our YouTube channel but because of the difficulty of the search feature within YouTube, 
we have chosen to host on Bible Truth and Prophecy. So now every video you search for within the site, you can be guaranteed that it will be of a Christadelphian nature. We also have a preaching video section where any Ecclesia is invited to download and use or embed these videos within their own Ecclesial websites. We also have an exhortation service where we produce two or three exhortations per week which we then circulate to brethren and sisters in isolation. We also have an ever-growing list of approved Christadelphian sites. We also have a page of live news feeds so you can keep up to date with all the breaking news as it happens. We also have a section for the daily readings. Each day at around midnight we publish all three of the daily readings and then later on in the day we publish thought for the days often based on all three portions of the daily readings. Within each daily reading post there is also a link to enable you to have the Bible chapter read to you directly. We also feature Bible in the News videos, videos which we have produced from the Bible in the News website. We also feature Brother Don Pierce's milestone snippets, which come out approximately three times a week. We also feature Andy Walton's weekly World Watch, and other commentaries and analysis from other brethren on World News events. You can also subscribe to the blog and be notified of posts as they happen in real time and also subscribe to the weekly newsletter which is provided by christadelphianvideo.org. Every page and post on the site has the facility to be able to leave a comment or make an observation, so please take advantage of this and let us know what you think of the site.